Thank you, Steve. I think that sets us up really nicely for the next stage of research, which I'm going to be talking you through now, which is how consistent use of music influences effectiveness. We've heard about the challenges and the opportunities. What we need to do now is answer one important question. Do ads which use music consistently outperform other types of ads? Just to reiterate the point Steve mentioned about consistent use of music, when we use that term, we mean ads that have used the same track over consecutive campaigns and across different touch points. What we're looking to do here is compare those to tactical one-off ads and those with no music at all. As Mark mentioned at the beginning, music is an incredibly powerful tool for brand owners and agencies. It really has that power to manipulate our emotions. And it conveys complex feelings that go beyond what language can describe. In many ways, music transcends language altogether, which is perhaps why, as human beings, we find it such a difficult subject to talk about. Neurologically, the parts of our brain that process music are very different from the parts of our brain that process logic, language, and reason. So it stands to reason that it would be difficult for us to talk about it. But from a research point of view, this creates challenges. How are we able to really measure, validate, and truly understand the effect of music on a subconscious level? We need an approach that is able to get beyond explicit memory, an approach that allows us to really dig down into the subconscious mind and find out how we think and feel. It's an approach we call neuroqual. It's essentially the, the blending together of the, the best of neuroscience, which for us is EEG, and good qualitative research, and to interrogate both implicit and explicit responses, compare those to give us much richer, deeper, more scientifically valid results. The way it works is we get a participant to come along to the lab, we get them wired up with a, an EEG cap which has 32 different electrodes and measures their electrical activity in their brain. We show them some stimulus, that gives us the implicit response. Then during that experiment we give them prompted questions that they answer, uh, usually on a scale of 1 to 4, 1 to 5. And then afterwards we uh, do some qualitative interviews to understand why people felt that way. So if you like, the EEG gives us the, the subconscious, implicit, nonverbal response, and the four-button machine and qualitative research gives us the subjective, explicit responses and the reasons why. Uh, for our study, uh, we did uh, 16 participants. Um, now, on the face of it, that might appear like quite a small number. Certainly for those of you that are well-versed in commissioning quant or even qual studies, 16 interviews ostensibly looks like a small number, but actually, for EEG, it's all it takes for us to get to statistical significance. It's one of the questions I get asked most, because I know it sounds counterintuitive, but I'll, I'll give it a go. So in quant studies, we get statistical power through large sample sizes. In EEG, we get statistical power through measuring millions and millions of different data points across the cross-section of the scalp. The magic number we look for is a p-value of 0.05. That tells us that it is statistically significant, and more often than not, we achieve that with 16 interviews. We also, for our experiment, played 27 different radio ads, and we split those equally into three pots of consistent music, tactical one-off, and those with no music um, at all. And during the prompted questions using the four-button box, we asked them how familiar were the ads, how much did they like the ads, how much did they like the music, and to what extent did the music fit the ad? Just a quick note um, about the stimulus. I think this is fairly important for us to talk about, just so that you have a really clear idea of how the experiment was run. This was one of the great challenges we had um, at outset of the project, um, was getting a set of stimulus together that was fair, balanced, and as real world as possible. I think it took us um, about a month in total to get all this stuff together, and I think we must have sifted through close to a thousand ads to, to get a fair representative um, stimulus. We were very keen to get a good representation across uh, product categories, so we included FMCG, utilities, travel, retail, government, and finance, a good spread across those, a good spread across music types as well, so we're sure to include orchestral, retro, and contemporary types of music. And we also um, uh, made sure that all the ads that we tested were also running on TV. 
Here's a, just a very kind of quick snapshot of what that stimulus looks like. You can see a really good spread there um, across the, the different pots. Just a quick note to, to say that we're not analyzing ads at an individual level here. We're analyzing them at a collective level by the pot they're in. So consistent versus tactical versus no music at all. Just before I come on to the, to the main results, I just want to um, quickly explain how we were able to run this study. We partnered up with uh, Goldsmiths University, who are world leading in the area of psychology and neuroscience. They specialize in music, emotion, and creativity, and have done published many, many, many articles uh, to the likes of the Wall Street Journal, The Economist, uh, The New Scientist. Um, so they really knew what they were doing. So, on to the results. We're going to start off first by looking at the explicit results. These are the results that come through from the four-button box. Um, so the first thing to note here is, is that ads that use music consistently perform better on music measures. If I just draw your attention to the left-hand side, um, we can see that consistent music outperforms tactical. We obviously don't have a bar here for no music for fairly obvious reasons, I hope. Um, but this is interesting. This is really, really interesting because as we heard from Steve, that there were some real concerns when we spoke to advertisers about playing consistent music. Were consumers going to become bored? Were they going to tune out? Wear out was a term we heard very often. But what we're seeing here is that actually the more consistent music is played, the more familiar it becomes, the more consumers like and engage it. If we look here to the right-hand side, uh, music brand fit, this probably isn't a big surprise. Um, we're seeing a hugely statistically significant result in favor of consistent versus tactical here. Um, and that should be no surprise to us because we're conditioning people to associate music to a brand and we're repeating that over time. So we're teaching people to associate, make those connections. So perhaps not a big surprise there. But I think it also reinforces the point we heard from advertisers about the importance of brand recognition. I think also hints at the tonal fit of music with a brand that develops over time. On to the next slide. So what we're seeing here is that the, the ads that use music consistently are also performing better on advertising measures of likability and familiarity. So looking at the left, we can see, again, consistent music outperforming tactical one-off versus no music. Again, not a big surprise. There's a very well-known phenomenon in psychology called the familiarity principle or the mere exposure effect, which says the more we hear something or the more we're exposed to something, the more we like it. Looking here at ad familiarity, um, as we can see, again, this is um, hugely significant in terms of consistent um, outperforming tactical and no music. As I said at the beginning, for statistical significance, we're aiming for a p-value of 0.05. What we have here is a p-value of 0.001, which means it's hugely significant in terms of familiarity. So just a quick recap on uh, some things we've learned here. I think really interesting that there appears to be a thread of causality between um, familiarity, likability, and brand fit that's perhaps very interesting for, for brand owners. And actually, we saw a lot of this in, in the qualitative interviews as well, where we got almost an instant brand uh, recognition. Really interesting quote. We heard many of such quotes in our research. When I heard the music to Lloyd's, I instantly remembered what brand it was. It was the same with British Airways and British Gas. I knew it instinctively. The music is the brand. OK. So now we're going to come on to the star of the show. Um, this is the meaty bit, the EEG results, the implicit data. These are the nonverbal, subconscious um, responses that people gave. So these are the results I'm going to provide to you now. I, I do need to. Um, just say a quick word. I know perhaps many of you haven't seen um, any charts quite like the, with all these squiggly lines um, going on. Has anybody seen anything like this before? Yeah? Okay. Not many people. So let me explain a little bit how this works. I'll try and be as brief as I can because I don't, don't want to bore you guys. But basically what happens is we've got an EEG cap on someone's head and that picks up certain parts of, of the brain. We've got the frontal temporal, the occipital, which deals with visual processing, the parietal on the top, which deals with spatial awareness, navigation, sensory information. And what we're doing is we're collecting a, a, a kind of a collective signal that kind of comes through. 
And what we do at the analysis is we tease that signal apart into different band frequencies, as we can see there on the left, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, and delta. And then we start looking at those individual band frequencies in detail to see if there's anything interesting going on. Now, what I do need to say here is, is that um, we know from many, many other studies um, that gamma and beta are of particular interest to us. Um, they signify brain activation. And um, there's many studies done. There's one study which looked at um, how people felt when they won whilst they were gambling. And what they found was is their brains lit up with lots of this beta gamma activity. Also, another more recent example, I think of July this year, which was looking at um, movie trailers. They were looking at how people felt while they looked at movie trailers and then tied that to uh, the commercial success of those. And what they found was that movies that were particularly successful, you know, with high box office sales, also uh, participants exhibited a lot of this beta and gamma activity. So it's a proxy for commercial success also. Just one other thing we're interested in here, um, which is uh, the alpha band frequency. Um, that is indicative of what we call approach behaviors. I'll talk a little bit more about that um, as we go on. But for the purposes of this, um, beta and gamma um, should just mean to you brain activation, engagement, enjoyment, and commercial success. OK, so let's take a look at some of the results. Um, what we can see here is, is that ads that use music consistently are generating significantly more of this gamma and beta. Um, as we can see here on the left-hand side, uh, beta band power is outperforming, again, on consistent versus tactical and no music. On the right-hand side, a significant, um, uh, significantly more amount of gamma band power for consistent use of music. And actually, visually, um, if you look at... Um, these heat maps here that we've got, which kind of measure the electrical activity in the brain, you can see that they're much more kind of colorful and lit up. So beta and gamma are, we're seeing significantly more in terms of activation. Interestingly, at an aggregate level, um, we're seeing a 41% um, uplift in brain activation for consistent use of music versus tactical one-off music, which is, um, a substantial increase. And this suggests that when music is applied consistently, it engages the subconscious brain far more effectively than tactical music. So this is interesting. So, you know, going back to the concerns we heard from the advertising community about wear out and boredom, actually what we have here is real scientific evidence to the contrary that actually repeated and recognized forms of music actually has the opposite effect and reaches out and engages people at a deeper level more effectively. I also alluded to the alpha band frequency as indicative of approach behaviors. Uh, this is kind of interesting. What we're seeing in the results is an asymmetry on the left side of the brain, which um, from many studies suggests um, approach behaviors. If it's on the right hand side of the brain, it's what we call avoid behaviors. But as I say, we're seeing this on the left-hand side of the brain. There's a very famous study done, um, well, certainly in neuroscience circles, called the Vecchiato study, which basically pinpoints this left-side asymmetry as being indicative of enjoyment and the deeper reward pathways of the brain. So this is interesting to us. And what is also interesting is, is that we're seeing a significant amount of this, much more than we would normally see. We would never see anything usually quite so clear-cut. So we got curious about this, and we wanted to investigate a little bit more. Um, we did um, what's called an instantaneous gamma amplification analysis. Sorry, that's a bit of a tongue twister. But basically, we looked at a little bit more detail of what was going on here. And this is what we found. The squiggly purple-pink line um, is uh, showing consistent music. The blue line is showing tactical music. And what we can see from this is, is that the pink line is featuring higher up than the blue line. This suggests sustained attention, which consistent music enables that tactical music doesn't. And we could hypothesize that there's some sort of uplift effect, that as soon as someone hears the music, they instantly recognize it, and then they like it and engage with it more. So just to wrap things up, just want to share a few uh, key uh, findings, really, from the EEG. We've learned that ad when ads um, use music consistently, they're better liked and more rewarding. Um, they also show higher scores on familiarity. 
and brand fit and associate, um, stimulate, sorry, these uh, approach behaviors. And finally, they show greater engagement at a subconscious level. And I think this all fits in with contemporary wisdom. Um, so if we look at the likes of uh, Byron Sharp, who talks with great authority, I think, on the importance of consistency, the importance of sensory cues like music, the importance of making things easy to remember. It's what he calls physical and mental availability. I think it very much fits into that narrative. Also, um, as Mark mentioned earlier on, uh, the seminal study um, by Peter Field and Les Binet, the long and short of it, which also extols the virtues of consistent use of music as better, uh, creating better profits for business. I think this fits into that narrative really quite nicely. So now we've discovered how music communicates for brands. We need to set out what does music communicate for brands, which brings us uh, quite nicely, I think, onto um, the final ambition of this project, which is to provide agencies with guidance and real inspiration on how music can be linked more objectively to brands, which point I'm going to pass you over to Chris. Thank <laughs> you.